Well, for those who were expecting to see the service as well as hear it, that's not going to happen today. Uh, you, uh, unless you're here, <laughs> but uh, so we have the audio only today. So we remember, we're faith comes by hearing the word of God. You don't have to see it, so it's by hearing. But here we are on March the seventh, uh, our online service. And we're glad that you have tuned in and uh, and we're glad that we have uh, people with us this morning. And uh, so let's open with prayer. Our Father, we thank you for truly faith has come to us by hearing the word of God. Someone has shared it with us. Someone has quoted scripture and we grow in faith through hearing the word of God. We have come to believe that because our lives have been changed by hearing your word. So we gather today, we read the scripture, we uh, go through that scripture and we trust that as we go, you will work in our lives to accomplish the building of our faith, and maybe for some coming to faith. So we thank you and we praise you and we give you high praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, today we uh, have just a couple of uh, announcements uh, and uh, basically, uh, communion in a couple of weeks, not next week, but the week after. And uh, we have a few people to pray for. We're very thankful that um, Granger, Glenn, had his uh, heart ablation, and it went very well. So that man has been through it. But when I called him within an hour after him getting out, he answered the phone. I'm doing fine. How are you? Praise the Lord. So that's really neat. Um, Ricky McCoy has an abscess he's dealing with, and uh, that has uh, been treated now, and we hope for healing for him. Uh, we have many uh, other situations and people that are on our minds, uh, so we will remember them in prayer. Uh, we are now going to move into our scripture reading, and today it's from Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews 10, verse 26 through 31. <clears throat> this may sound hard to you at first, but... As a matter of fact, uh, some people have said this is the most stern warning in all of Scripture. Now, that's saying a lot, but uh, there is a very much a reason for it. And we're going to hopefully plummet into this, uh, the depth of this uh, Scripture today. May the Lord grant us understanding. But I do want to remind you of what I said in, when I was dealing with the first part of Hebrews 10 a few weeks ago. And that is that Hebrews 10 is a sandwich. It's got uh, one piece of bread is encouragement. The other piece of bread is encouragement. But in the middle is a warning. There's some real meat there to chew on. What was the first encouragement? The first encouragement is the way has been made open for us to come in and worship through Jesus Christ. We've come into the Holy of Holies and we worship him. What's the other encouragement? At the end of this chapter, he says, uh, some people in the world are apostate. They have turned away from the Lord. But in your case, he says, I feel confident that you're going to go on. And so there's the two things that bring us confidence, that bring us assurance. And the Lord wants us to have assurance. But there is a warning. There is something that, that helps 
not helps, uh, hurts our assurance. And that is deliberate sin. When we allow deliberate sin and excuse it and justify it and go on in it, it works against our assurance, doesn't it? And we don't, we, we, the Lord doesn't want us to be fighting that battle of assurance. He wants us to have full assurance, but that means we need to take deliberate sin uh, seriously and allowing the Holy Spirit to help us. Uh, we cry out to him and he helps us. Now, having said that, let's read Hebrews 10, beginning at verse 26 and going through 31. If we deliberately keep on sinning, see, there it is. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we've received the knowledge of truth, no sacrifice for sins is left. Now I'm going to come back and, and talk about that. Verse 27, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. In other words, if a few people um, denounced their faith and people witnessed it, they were cut off from the people of God in the day of Moses. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the son of God underfoot, who is treated as an unholy thing, the blood of the covenant that, uh, that was sacrificed for us and who has insulted the spirit of grace. For we know him who said, it is mine to avenge, I will repay. And again, listen to this verse. The Lord will judge his people. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. We know that uh, we need to spend time in this to talk about what is being said here, what is not being said here. And like I said, the whole purpose is for the Lord, for us to know his love and to be assured. You know, I want to talk about three things. First of all, the place of warning in God's word. In Hebrews alone, there are five warnings. This is the main one. Uh, I want to talk about why God warns us why that's important to our faith. Secondly, we're going to talk about what is the specific warning in this passage. And thirdly, how we can heed that warning and the difference practically it makes in our life. So first of all, let's talk about warning. You know, today, many people don't want, they would take all the warnings of scripture out. They would say, we, that's, that's rough language. We don't want rough language from God. God should give us soft, encouraging language all the time. What's this about warning? You know, I don't want anyone talking to me that way. Well, let's talk about warning. I would submit to you that warning is an essential part of any love relationship. God warns us because he loves us. I've told this story many times in the past, but it, it's so embedded in my life. Uh, the time that I took some guys my freshman year in college, I went to school up in Ohio and I was from the hills of Kentucky and they were all fascinated with my uh, stories and the mountains and my, you know, my accent and, and everything. So the first break, I took a bunch of them down there with me and we went up to my favorite place where we would uh, get in our Jeeps and go up into the mountains and off road and, 
and have a really good time uh, to Stone Canyon. And so we went up there and I was going to show them at night. We were going to look on from the top of that mountain way over into Virginia and Tennessee. You could see for miles and miles all the lights. Well, we got up there and and I built this up and they jumped out of the Jeep and they scattered in every direction. And suddenly it hit me. There is a cliff about 50 feet out there, a 300 foot drop. And, and the instinct was I leaned on the horn of the Jeep. I just said, if I said stop, they may not hear me. They, I'd leaned on the horn and they all stopped in their tracks. And then I said, don't move. There's a cliff out there. It was a moonless night, by the way. It was totally dark. Do you know how many times I have replayed in my mind that without that warning, my life, would have been ruined, not to speak of the fact that others could be killed. And sure enough, when I turned the lights of the Jeep on, there were some of the guys about 10 feet from that cliff. And it, they, it would have been certain death. We should thank God for the warnings in our life. Now, some people abuse warnings. I think that's one of the reasons people sometimes don't like to hear them. Maybe they had a mother who warned them every five seconds about some possible danger. Or they were manipulated by people, trick you by warnings. You know, that's a big thing in advertising sometimes. Trick people into, you know, you warn them they need this, they've got to have this, you know, and it's not true. But we're talking about God's warnings. We're talking about someone who loves us and created us and only does that which is good for us. Warnings are extremely important. As in this passage talks about judgment. I've talked about this before. Judgment is very important. You know, God would not love the world if he didn't someday put an end. What if the world just went on and on and on this way? We would say God's not just do anything about it. He didn't stop it. <laughs> Judgment is an act of mercy. Now, God is very reluctant to bring judgment upon us. Isn't he patient with us? He's so patient. He brings temporal judgments into our life. Those are wake up calls. But there is one eternal judgment coming and it's real. It's real. We must not uh, slough that off at all, or we must not shut our ears to it. I want to ask you today, have you taken God's warnings seriously? Do you welcome them? Do you thank him? Like those guys profusely thank me. I mean, I nearly killed them. <laughs> but had you not done that, This is God's warning. He does it only for a good reason. He doesn't manipulate people. He doesn't control people. He doesn't trick people. This is all for our good because the warnings are about something that's real. Why do people not take seriously God's warnings. A lot of people uh, have this false sense of assurance that they're going to, that this is not real. There's not going to be a judgment. There are lots of pastors who don't believe in the reality of hell and the, a coming judgment. 
They think that's, again, just language to motivate you, to get you to obey God. No, God doesn't operate that way. He's not going to tell us something unless it's real. He said, yeah, but I believe God is good and he gives us a second chance and third chances and fourth chances. Deep down inside of me, I don't believe he's going to send me through the judgment because he loves me and he's not going to let that happen. That's exactly what God has already done for us in Jesus Christ. He has given us that ultimate escape from judgment. He has said judgment is coming, but you don't have to go through it. And this passage is saying no other sacrifice for sins is left. What does that mean? That means I don't have any more that I can give you. There is nothing more to keep you from judgment other than my son giving his life and shedding his blood for the forgiveness of your sin. So really, God has already done that. He's not already, he's not only been patient with us, he's been patient to that extent that even if we didn't think it was real, he's going to give us an all a way out. And he's saying, the New Testament is saying, and this passage is saying, there is no other chance. This is real. Please take it seriously. And of course, a lot of people think, well, I, I think my life is going to stand up all right and I can get through the judgment. Please <laughs> know how foolish that thinking is. If we think our record is, is so good, that we could stand before a holy God and deserve heaven without Christ, then we're deluded. So we've talked about now the, the warnings of scripture and how important they are for us to take. Don't skip over the warnings. Don't say to yourself, well, that's, uh, God, let me help you here. Let me have you temper this a little bit. Let me have you be a little softer so people will accept it. That would be like me whispering out the window for those guys to stop. Uh, guys, would you, would you please, uh, would you think about this? Would you consider, I, now I'm doing this for your good. They would be dead already. No, I leaned on the horn. The warning was real because the threat was real. So please, you may need to adjust a bit in your thinking. I ask you again, do you gladly receive the warnings of the Bible and the hard parts of language in the Bible that are for your good and my good, do we see them as God's mercy? God's mercy. You know, any good parent uses warnings. How are you going to raise a child without warning them about things? Don't run into the street. Don't, you know, whatever. How about in the work world? If somebody's discipling, if somebody's training someone, doesn't training include the warnings? You know, Hugo, you had a machine shock. Somebody could saw their arm off. Don't you warn them <laughs> how to use the machinery correctly? We receive those warnings. Why don't we receive the warnings of God? Well, There's a reason for that, and it's called pride. We shut our ears to God's warnings because we're confident that we've got everything under control or it's not going to happen or it's not going to happen yet, so I'm fine now. 
The Lord and the Holy Spirit helps us to see ahead. Isn't it amazing that we prepare for every eventuality except for the judgment? We'll prepare, you know, we got to have our insurance policies. We got, what if this happens? What if that happens? And we'll, people will do all of those preparations, except we often have shut our ears to the most important thing we could ever be warned about. That is of eternal consequence. Well, let's talk about this specific passage, Hebrews chapter 10. It starts out and it says, um, if we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left. Now, a lot of people take that the wrong way right off the bat. They take it out of guilt because you see, every single one of us here has been involved in deliberate sin. Everyone has done things that they knew were wrong. And they take that to mean, oh, oh, because I do that, the sacrifice for my sins is taken away and I'm lost forever. Now, there are people who actually take it that way. I hope our faith has more depth than that to think that because of a deliberate sin, we remember so on. This is talking about people who over a period of time deliberately sin to the point that they choose not to follow Christ anymore. They deliberately turn away from their faith and whatever the reasons are in their thinking. And this is called apostasy. This passage is not about losing one's salvation, because I would argue that we, all, for all of the scriptures that assure us, if you are chosen by God, that you cannot lose your salvation. But a lot of people have a uh, fall away because they never had the depth Maybe they were serious about their Christianity. Maybe they were really interested. Well, the ultimate example of this is Judas. Judas, who saw all the miracles, who heard all the teaching, and yet turned away. Somewhere in there, there was something was underlying all the serious that what we assume that he was serious in following Jesus and wanting to, to do it. But he turned away and deliberately chose. It's not something that just happened in a moment. It's something that he chose. See, the difference between Christians who sometimes have drifted or deliberately sinned, not to speak even of all of our unintentional sins, but even deliberate sins, the Christian will always come back. The Christian will express sorrow that that is in their life. They will try to get help. They will not keep it hidden forever. I think the whole Christian world is crying over Ravi Zacharias, who has had unbelievable influence in Christian circles. And only after his death, they found out that he lived a whole secret life of sexual sin that went on for years and was very deep. It wasn't you know, like an affair. I almost said just an affair. <laughs> no, it it was it was incredible. Now, he's in God's hands. I say nothing more about that. I'm just using that as an example of the fact that when we do not turn and make our sin known to brothers or sisters in Christ, and have accountability and cry out to God for help. That's what the Christian does. 
And, and, and I gave you the example last week. That's what David did. David's denial, David's sin went deep in the murder of Uriah and the affair with Bathsheba. But he turned back to the Lord and he paid a really high temporal price for that. But he came back. This is talking about the one who stay away. And, and you know, there's that passage just a few chapters earlier. It said once uh, the, the ground has drunk in the water, uh, the, it, it cannot uh, grow anything again on it. And again, people take that the wrong way. That once a person turns away from the Lord, that's it. They cannot come back. No, I just gave you an example of David. It's saying that there's nothing to save him except Jesus. And if you deny Jesus, because this is what it's about. It's not about our sin. It's about what we do with the person of Jesus. You see, there are three sins mentioned in this passage. And I want you to listen carefully. There are three sins. And uh, the, common, the English commentator William Barclay got this uh, really good. And I'm actually going to quote it from him. Number one, look at verse, this is Hebrews 10. And uh, verse uh, 28. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Now, and now actually 29 is what I'm wanting to get to. How much severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who tramples underfoot the son of God? In other words, they have rejected Christ in a final sense. Now, again, if they're in the Lord, even denial. Isn't it interesting that Peter denied the Lord three times? He was forgiven. He was restored. But there is a denial that is deliberate that the Bible tells us goes even deeper. And so that's the first sin. Denying Christ, or as it says here, trampling Christ underfoot. William Barclay wrote, a man can stand almost any attack on his body. The thing that beats him down is a broken heart. It is told that in the days of Hitler's terror, there was a man in Germany who was arrested, tried, tortured, and put into a concentration camp. He faced it all with gallantry and emerged erect and unbroken. Then, by accident, he discovered who it was who had laid information against him, it was his own son. That discovery broke him, and he died when he had endured everything before. When, see, the sin is not something we did or some habit, it's a denial of Christ. It's the sin is the, the denial of Christ. It's the broken relationship of one who created us, who loves us, who's given himself for us and will never stop loving us. It's like uh, when Caesar was murdered, he faced his assassins with unbelievable courage, but then he found out A2 Brute, uh, his friend Brutus was in on the assassination. That's the sin. It's the broken relationship with Christ. Secondly, the sin of the failure to see the sacredness of sacred things. It says here that he trampled the Son of God underfoot and treated as unholy the blood of the covenant that sanctified them. 
You know, nothing can rile up a Christian like sacrilege. You know, when you see people just, and, and I think we've all noticed in, in the last generation, in the last 40 years, the, 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 there used to be much more respect for things of the Lord, even by people who weren't Christians. There was a respect. There was a respect about holy places. There was respect, more of a respect about the name of Jesus. There, there was, and I'm not saying, oh, those are the good old days. No, I'm saying that we have seen the disrespect of things sacred go way, way down. Way down. The third sin that is mentioned here, now listen to this. And thirdly, who insult the spirit of grace. Who insult the spirit of grace. The other sin is not just against Jesus, it's against the Holy Spirit. And by saying no to all of the advances of the Holy Spirit to get us to come, to, to yield, to... Isn't that talked about in the Bible as the unforgivable sin when you're so hardened, you even turn against the Holy Spirit, the only one who can reach you? So what do we do? I know no one here would intentionally um, trample Christ underfoot and treat the sacred things is common or knowingly resist the Holy Spirit, but we can drift into it, can't we? We can take these things for granted. And that's what the whole book of Hebrews is about. Wake up. Don't, don't, don't take these things for granted. Keep sharp in your faith. So the third thing is, what do we do? What do we do? Well, he's already told us what to do earlier in Hebrews 10. It said, be sure we're worshiping God with a sincere heart, full assurance of faith. Make sure we're declaring our faith. Make sure we're meeting with the body. Make sure we're involved in ministry. And make sure we're going not letting uh, the difficult things of life trip us up. That's what he closes with. He said, you know, I think you guys are going to be all right because I've seen you give up property. I've seen you beaten for your faith. I've seen you suffering for your faith. And I, I, think, I think you will continue. So he stops with assurance. So this letter is full of assurance, and I would tell you that even the warning is an assurance to us. We have everything we need. We have Christ. We have the sacrifice for our sins. So come back. Uh, uh, pick up. Uh, encourage one another. Do the ministry we were called to do. This is not saying that once a person has sinned, even if they have denied their faith, I'm going to say it again, even if they have denied their faith, that's why God put Peter in there. He denied the Lord Jesus Christ, but he came back. We're praying for those to come back that we know. We're praying for people who are, Hiding, to come out of hiding. We're praying for all of us. You know, we have so many problems. It takes a lifetime and more to stop our deliberate sin. But we do it. We don't excuse it. We try, and so that's the other thing I would say practically. Let's stop. I, I hope the Holy Spirit will show us when we're justifying our deliberate sins. I see it out of my own mouth. 
I, 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 I justify why I, I, doing what I do. If we don't stop justifying, if we don't face the sin as a sin, then we're putting ourselves in that situation of acting like the gospel doesn't even exist. You know, we, we, uh, we don't want to live that way. Let's pray together. Lord, we pray that you would show us by your Holy Spirit we don't want to be hardened to the Spirit's call. That if we are deliberately doing those things which battle against the sense of assurance that the gospel gives, show us, Lord. And give us the strength. We cry out to you. Help us, Lord. Help us. So that it does not become habitual. To just go on. Doing the things that are not pleasing to you. Thank you, Lord. You've given us all the help we need. And all the mercy that is in Christ Jesus. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to play another hymn now. And even if you're listening from home, you might be able to hear this. We're playing one here. If uh, not, we will look forward to being with you uh, next week. And uh, but for now, let's uh, pray together and think about this as we see uh, people from another country sing. This is our benediction today. This will be our benediction. And uh, comes from Numbers chapter 6. Uh, and uh, Don found this and we like it a lot. Um, but each week for a while, we're going to do this same benediction, just like for several weeks I was doing the one from uh, Hebrews 13. Uh, here's another great blessing and benediction from scripture. And I think today the people singing it are from India, are they not? So we're going to be able to kind of worship with the international church, the worldwide church, uh, as we but receive this benediction and blessing from the Lord.